Good, good afternoon. Welcome. This is, uh, well, KTN Farmers Show. This is Farm Kenya, the show where each we are your trusted source for all matters agriculture. Today, as ever, we are coming at you from various different places here in Kenya, across the region, right across the world, to bring you up to speed on matters making business and agriculture headlines. We, of course, bring you information that enables you make decisions about your lives and livelihoods and how you can carve your niche in the field of agriculture right along the value chain. And of course, to remind you that when people talk about agriculture, they might think this is just about the well, soil, but there's many different opportunities along that value chain where you can tap in. Today we have an enlightening episode lined up for you. We'll be diving deep into the fascinating world right beneath our feet as we explore what we mean when we say that understanding our soil by diversity is important. Did you know that soil comprises about 25% of the world's biodiversity? Well, to discuss that and much, much more, joining us here in studio, Dr. Manoj Kaushal from the Alliance Biodiversity International. He will be telling us what that organization is later on in the show and will, of course, share his expertise on the critical role soil biodiversity plays in sustainable agriculture. Stay with us as we uncover the hidden life that continues to thrive beneath our feet in our soils and how that impacts our farming practices. Now, in the meantime, we, of course, have lined up Agri news for this week, so we'll start off with that. Let's take a look at what we have lined up for you in this week's edition of Agri news. Let's start off uh, in the coast and today our focus is octopus fishing where a group of women in Pate Island in Lamo County have taken on men's responsibilities which traditionally were around catching of octopus in that community. Now they're earning income and helping to meet the community's needs through fishing. Well, the women of Shanghai, Shikani and Mtagawanda villages have succeeded in building a kindergarten and hiring a teacher to manage it through this project thus solving the problem of the shortage of early childhood education facilities in the area. Here is Ali Manzu with more. Our boat trip from Lamu Island to Pate Island off the coast of Shanghai Shakani villages <laughs> took us about an hour and a half due to the strong winds and waves on the east side of Lamu County. <laughs> We met a group of about 100 members who are involved in special octopus fishing. Kwanza iko nzama sianze sahii uharibifu umeenda hali ya chini kabisa tofauti na zamani. Zamani uharibifu ulikuwa hali ya juu lakini ilipokuja conservancy yani uhifadhi na msimamo wake sahii uharibifu ni hali ya chini kupita kiasi. Walisema ni park lakini wanawake wakaanza kuingilia kufanya vikundi za wanawake wanaume hakubaliwa lakini sisi tukaamua tukafanya vikundi za wanawake tukatoa story ya Madagascar alafu tukafanya vikundi za wanawake wanawake kila mwanamke ndio akaenda kwa mume wake akimstolea hiyo story ndio akakubali tukafunga na sasa hii tumefaulu sasa hii tumefaulu here we are welcomed and serenaded with original songs from the Bajuni community this is a protected zone and fishing is not allowed as it is used for fish breeding sites before returning to the main deep ocean. Except for the octopuses that are ready to be caught, they are given that opportunity. Kwanza, tukuneti kitengote tuwapata octopus sepweza ambapo tunakilinda ili wavuvi wasije kuharibu. Nambambili. Kuna vile vile kuna coral reef restoration hapo ndani katika ushamba ambao hapo kuna samaki wengi kuna aina samaki tofauti tofauti kuna samaki rangi rangi kuna samaki wengi kuna tafi kuna tangu kuna tazanda fute kuna manyea tomat fish yani 
na kwa kila siku wiki badilika kila mwaka watu wakija ani samaki wanazidi kuongezeka unaona hasa ile kazi yetu nzuri ambayo tunaifanya na tunalinda ili kusiharibiwe na hakuna mvuvu mta moja ambaye anaenda ndani kwa ile bidii yetu na kazi yetu nzuri ndio kwa samaki wamezidi sana Asilimia samanini ya jamii yapate paka kiunga kule ni kwamba ni jamii inategemea uvuvi na uvuvi ni ni ngao kubwa kwetu kama kule bara watu wana mashamba yao lakini shamba letu sisi ni bahari sisi tukinukia tulinukia ni wavuvi lakini tulipokuanzisha mambo ya kuhifadhi tulipokuwa kupelekwa Madagaska NR China Tensik tupeleka Madagaska kuangalia wanawake wanapokuhifadhi na wanavuvua pweza tukirudi makwetu tukaanzisha BMU tatu pate shangashakani shangarubu alafu tukafanya awareness tukaamua kujifunga hili shamba la pweza I think the, the fisheries co management work that these communities in Pate Island are doing is 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 great and largely contributing to the uh, largely contributing to address the issue of of climate change because one uh, the these fisheries co management areas that they have set aside have uh, the the coral reefs that are, are protected and conserved they have the sea grasses and all this are helping us to to curb the issue of the of the climate change here the women show us how to remove an octopus from the corals along the beach line yaani tayari tushasaidika pakubwa kulingana na conservancy zamani waribifu ilikuwa ni mingi mikoko ilikuwa kikatwa kiolela olela yani msamaki wadogo walikuwa kivulua olela olela kamba wa mayai e, kamba wadogo lakini kuanzia conservancy yanze sasa hii kamba wadogo si rahisi kupata mtu amevua kamba mdogo ama kamba wa mayai sasa ile kuachana na ile kamba wadogo na kamba wa mayai ile uchumi sasa hii inapanda hii tumefanya ni shamba la pweza tunafunga baada ya miezi minne au mitatu tunafungua ona tumeti ya alama za kufunga hatuti fence ni boyas tu tunapanga hivi ili mvuvu akitoka ataona tu zile boyas imepangwa haingi hapa ndani tumefanya mraba minne tunaifunga lakini hasa mvuvu yote akitoka nje lazima ataona hiyo boyas bendera ataona hataingia hapa shamba la kahawa shamba la majani ni tofauti na shamba la pweza sababu shamba la pweza liko kwenye bahari hatuwezi kuweka fence they were guided by science to know which area is suitable for the octopus closures which areas is suitable for the for the for the locally managed marine areas for the not take zones and uh, which will be the target species oh. all that remains is to carefully look inside the corals why have women uh, prioritized the establishment of the octopus closures this is because of the biological characteristics of the of the octopus the octopus normally grow very fast they mature very fast uh, and they have a short lifespan they only have a lifespan of between 18 to 24 months so after four months uh, an octopus is ready for ready for harvest and uh, within uh, two years then it can die so if you don't harvest it is gone octopus is a type of fish that lives in the reefs in the sea unlike others their lifespan is short pate island boasts itself as the biggest producer of octopus and its main market is in part of mombasa normally they invite buyers during the opening there and they do auctioning on site before they go for fishing and any buyer who provides uh, the highest uh, price is the one who is going to buy the octopus from the from the closures and since we started the price that the buyers normally provide is always uh, a double or even thrice the normal or, or the local market market price tukimvua hupweza wakati tukifungua soko linapanda saa hii soko ni 120 lakini tukifungua tulifungua kwa kilo kila kilo pweza shilingi 400 kiangalia wanawake wote wamefaidika wamejenga nyumba nzuri wanapeleka watoto wao shule vizuri wanafanya mahitaji yao ya nyumbani vizuri hata wazee sahi wanafurahika kwa sababu ya hili shamba letu la pweza ile kamba kikubwa mkubwa kama kilo moja na uzo na bei nzuri na yule mdogo bei yake wa ya chini sasa imesaidia jamii pakubwa na jamii wameanza kuelewa umuhimu wao kwa mazingira mbali na sisi kuwasaidia kwa elimisha sasa hii wanaona kipacho chao cha samaki pia kimekuwa cha juu thamani ilikuwa samaki paka mdogo anauzwa kwa beiduni sahi wanatafuta samaki wakubwa wanapata soko na samaki mkubwa na bei kubwa kuliko samaki mdogo
After selling their produce, some of the proceeds are used to empower the community. Matumbawe liharibiyo kwa sababu uvyo harangu. Lakini tuliamua kuregesha matumbawe. Hata sisi wenye tukajenga nyumba za samaki kwa mikono yetu. Tensi na NRT wakatusaidia, tukaweka nyumba za samaki kwa, kwa, kwa kijiji, tukachengeza kwa mikono yetu, alafu tukazibuaga hapa. This is one of the success of this group which use their income to build the only kindergarten to serve their villages. Kuna nasari hapo, kuna nyumba za samaki hapo, tulitengiza ni sisi wenye wanawaki. Apart from managing the school, their income is also used to pay the salary of one teacher who ensures that education continues for these angels of Shanga Ishakani Island. Through initiatives from the Northern Rangeland Trust Organization, they have supported these women and enabled them to be independent in the community while their husbands are busy fishing in the high seas. <laughs> the community here has been responsible enough in solving the challenges of education and other challenges. <laughs> wakijia wa stare, wakute samaki wako wengi, wakute mikoko minawiri, wakute kasa wako wengi, wanufaike na wandele na kimaisha bila kupata matatizo, bila kupata shida yote. Women involvement is very critical in success of a fisheries co-management co -management work. Initially when, when uh, the conservancy started, uh, there was no like gender balance, uh, but uh, NRT through partnership, uh, through the conservancy, we have managed to mainstream gender within the, the community, community structures. Now women are very much engaged in this fisheries core management work and they are also benefiting from these resources. Ali Manzu, KTN News, Shanghai Shakani, Lamu County. Beautiful story there from Lamu County with Ali Manzu. Of course, uh, to again remind you that agriculture goes beyond not just the soil economy the usual agriculture that people are used to but also into the marine economy and that value chain now staying with something like that but from a different part of the country livestock farmers from the lake region have received a major boost following the launch of an innovative platform that will help them access essential animal vaccines now the initiative to be piloted in kisumu county for the next seven months also seeks to revolutionize the livestock vaccine distribution system right across East Africa. Take a look. Livestock diseases causes annual losses of about 25% of animals, yet less than 15% of smallholder farmers cannot obtain these crucial vaccines due to high transportation costs, a congested supply chain, and an inadequate cold chain infrastructure. It is against this backdrop that after remarkable success in Ghana that the innovation revolutionized the animal health sector that Cowtribe East Africa opted to employ innovative technologies such as drones to expedite vaccines deliveries and ensure timely and high quality access to farmers in Kenya. And therefore, we try to shorten the time that it takes for a farmer to receive vaccines. It also to be fast and also ensure that it maintains the quality the vaccine is required to have before it's actually administered to an animal. So we are happy actually to be here and uh, starting off with Kisumu. Kautra will be working in uh, eight counties around the lake, uh, lake region. This is the lake economic block. Um, Gillian Koech is the Director General of Cowtribe. She says that the project will start in Kisumu and expands to eight counties in the Lake Region Economic Block, including Siaya, Homabay, Migori, Kisi, Kericho, and Nyamira. Koech adds that Cowtribe's model has proven to be highly effective with expedited delivery at no charge through a highly automated low-cost virtual vaccine dispensary system and we are in partnership with Zipline who are providing the logistical end 
of the vaccines uh, to go to the farmer. We are a full systemized uh, company, so the farmers get registered online using an application which they download on their phone. They're able to register themselves. They're able to even define the type of uh, livestock that they have. If it's how many goats, how many sheep, how many cows. So we're able to get that data properly, which also helps when it comes to vaccine production and also when we are monitoring uh, animal diseases that can affect animals. According to Kisumu Deputy Governor Matthew Willey, the cow tribe innovation will play a pivotal role in enhancing livestock health and consequently improve the livelihoods of farming communities. But uh, we have many areas that are underserved. Okay? As she has just said, there are many places where you know, we cannot access okay, uh, using uh, the conventional means. And so the drone technology, leveraging on the drone technology that has been in Kisumu for some time now, will help uh, Cow Tribe and of course the county government of Kisumu and other counties, she's talked about working in eight counties, have a better reach uh, to the farmers in terms of just ensuring that we have 100% vaccination. To the farmers who graced the event, it was a relief as the process of accessing the vaccine is expensive and tiresome, especially when one owns lots of animals. Damuel Bire, KT News, Kisumu. Definitely benefits there for the farmer and the goats which are getting a vaccine. Now, 1.4 million school-going children right across the country are said to benefit from the global nutritional campaign that aims to promote healthy living. Now, the initiative is intended to promote a healthy eating habit and overall improvement of nutritional knowledge for younger children. Now, this followed a report that said that about 18% of all children at the age of five in Kenya are stunted with poor nutrition to blame. Uh, we are glad to be here today for the culmination of the Good Breakfast Program, which is a school's program that aims to take kids through what Good Breakfast is for 21 days. They take home uh, diaries that they record what they're eating every day and in that they're meant to record if they're having a protein, a carbohydrate, a vitamin or a good fat. This actually is telling us that um, mothers um, would want to feed their children the right thing but that sometimes they are not sure um, and therefore this is more an advocacy program where we really promote feeding of uh, of children with good, good breakfast and what does good breakfast entail it entails making sure the children have balanced diet when they are going to school hiyo bluebird itawasaidia wanafunzi wetu katika kupata vitamins pata carbohydrates na vile vile kupata proteins uh, na fiber pia na good fats na watoto wetu watapata afya ya kutebea kufanya kazi yao na kusoma pia now let's stay with livestock, but the government has urged livestock farmers living in arid and semi-arid lands across Kenya to take advantage of the vibrant livestock market between Kenya and neighboring countries and further abroad to improve their livelihoods. Now the PS for Livestock Development, Jonathan Mweke, said that the communities that mobilize and create market linkages under the direct drive project have already benefited from about 17,000 livestock sold in Wajir County. Goods and sheep and cows and we will ensure that we can change the economy of Wajir County for the better and for good. Dali tuingie kwa groups tutafute wafugaji wako na mifugo mtu alete mifugo yao hata kama ni mbuzi moja mbuzi mbili kila wiki vile governor wenu ametangaza hapa Soko hiko. Tumetafuta soko. Huku Kenya, kuna soko Iran, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, na kuingine. Wanataka nyama yetu. Na njini ndiyo mkona mifugo. We really want this thing to succeed. Because our mainstay is livestock rearing. And the problem with livestock is that today you can be very rich. And after the next drought, you will be an IDP probably on the peripheries of this town. 
I don't think Samburu has more livestock than us. I don't think Tana River has more livestock than us. So that means we're not selling this thing well enough to our people. So we need to do more. Well, that story there, of course, about the drive project, which is the de-risking and the livestock value chain project, is a collaboration between the government of Kenya, the World Bank, and various countries across the region and other partners like Zepri, which is, of course, providing insurance oversight various banks to provide insurance and financing and financial knowledge and inclusion for the farmers along the value chain something of course for the people out there in the pastoralist areas now we are at the point where we want to go to the commodity prices but before that just to remind you that in studio we have very special guest here to talk about soil biodiversity he's going to tell us what that means of course that is dr manoj kaushal from the alliance biodiversity international he's here to share his expertise on the critical role that soil biodiversity plays in sustainable agriculture that in a few minutes first let's take a quick look at the commodity prices for the day and in this week's edition we'll look at the cassava and arrowroot prices in various markets right around the country. Take a look. Brought to you by Safaricom, the proud sponsor of Team Kenya at the Olympics. As Brazil and Kenya took to the Olympic court for the first time in Paris 2024, put it away. Jose Maria finished with 13 points, the opposite coming from the back court. Just had that ability, that power, and also. This week on What's Your Story, we continue with the story of Dr. Catherine Masitsa, also known as Dr. C. Being Dr. C, what's that like? What's that even? It's about being real. Yes. Living life mm -hmm. on your terms, biting it with the biggest spoon, and just being. Uh, Ask yourselves, when you're leaving in the morning, if I was fearless today, what would I do? Be fearless and go and do that which you want to do. I love that. Mind your business. No one does it better for children than KTN Home. Information, education, adventure, and excitement. BBC one, two, three, and do re me. Come along and you will see. The more they travel, the more you know. Get ready, let's go. KT 
RTL. Welcome home, kids. Well, indeed, again, thank you for staying with us here on From Kenya. My name is Peter Wakaba. On this part of the show, we will want, of course, to get into a discussion that engages our guest on just what soil biodiversity is and his expertise around that. And to get right into it, uh, Dr. Manoj Kaushal from the Alliance Biodiversity International, or CIAT, he's going to explain that acronym to us in just a few minutes, is a cropping systems expert. He is also an expert in soil health and soil microbe crop interactions and below ground soil microbial diversity, integrated nutrient management systems, soil and plant health, plant, crop, uh, plant and crop protection and disease management. Those being the major uh, areas of his expertise. But I will let him speak for himself. Dr. Manoj Karibu Sana. Yeah, so first off, please start by introducing yourself uh, in the, the least complicated fashion possible. Tell us what it is that you do. Uh, first of all, good afternoon. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Peter, for having me. Yes. And uh, good afternoon to all your viewers. Mm -hmm. So myself is Dr. Manoj Karshal, and I work for, as you said, Alliance of Biodiversity International, yes. NCH. Yes. It's one of the organization and the CGIR, which is a bigger umbrella organization. Uh -huh. yes. It's a consultative group of international agriculture research where they have a different 15 centers across the globe mm -hmm. and Alliance of Biodiversity International and CIAT is one of them. Mm -hmm. The headquarter is based in Rome and but I am personally based in, in Nairobi in Kenya. Yes. And I'm a soil health scientist working uh, into different uh, uh, soil problems and uh, looking for how to increase, uh, improve the soil health as well as improving the farm productivity. Mm -hmm. So what is soil health? You see you're a soil health scientist. Uh, people know uh, human health, animal health. We were talking about vaccines there. What is soil health? So the soil health is, uh, uh, I guess, is, is people understand with the help of human health. Human health, yes. when we, we talked about, means human is healthy when he is fully functional. Mm -hmm. The same way, we can say it's a soil health. Soil health is a capacity of the soil when it has full ability mm -hmm. to function and mm -hmm. to perform the functions for the crop growth and uh, the production systems. So that's what we call the soil health when it, uh, it, it, is a, it has a full ability mm -hmm. to give back to the crops and to the plants to perform at the, at the maximum position so that we will get the maximum beneficial in terms of the production systems in our crops, uh, nutrient efficacies, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so in your opinion, what then would you call healthy soil? So that if we said that uh, uh, I have a farm or this is a forest and this, this place has healthy soil, uh, how would we be able to differentiate that from soil that we would say is not healthy? Yeah, that's a very good question actually. The healthy soils is probably we can differentiate easily from uh, from unhealthy one. Mm. The healthy soil always have an, a better organic matter content in the soil. It has a better uh, retention capacities in terms of a water retention capacities, mm. have an optimum moisture content in the soils and less prone to the disease and the pest. Mm. Otherwise, uh, 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 as well as the other abiotic and biotic stress conditions compared mm -hmm. to the non-healthy soils. Mm -hmm. So that's what we, we perform, the health, uh, we can call it as a healthy soil and always it is better in terms of the growth and the productivity of the, of the crops. Mm -hmm. For a long time people thought that uh, soil health is a thing that just happened, uh, such that if I'm a farmer, I inherited or bought my land uh, there's soil in the ground, so it should be healthy and should be able to support every anything or anything that I want within reason in that ecosystem. And we're starting to learn that this is not the case. Now, is this just something that has developed because of modern technology or is it something that has been there over time? And how come we never used to hear about soil health before? 
I think that has been there over time. Mm. Mm, but the thing is that when there was a, a lot of push towards the use of the heavy machineries, modern mm. equipments, as you said, uh, use of uh, fertilizers, and there was only uh, one push towards improving or increasing the productivity. Uh -huh. But besides, we are uh, kind of a little bit forgetting yes. about our soil health, that mm -hmm. apart from productivity, we need to consider uh, to improving our soil health yes. uh, so that uh, that remains sustainable and the healthy over the years. And that also helps for the future generations or the future uh, people who are coming in the in the farming systems. So that has been over time uh, still under consideration, but in a very little amount. Uh, mm -hmm. While there has been a lot of push towards um, reducing the poverty, improving the economics and the livelihoods, and so somehow it has been pushed behind. But now a good thing is that uh, people have talked about, uh, started talking about a lot of agroecology practices, soil health and improving farming systems in a sustainable manner. Mm -hmm. So that's how bring um, brought the soil health in, in the mainstream of, of our agriculture. Mm. There, there are those who uh, say, just like uh, they are saying about climate change now, uh, that uh, soil health is a, is a hoax, so to say, is not true, is not important, uh, that the soil will always take care of itself. Uh, that human beings uh, as farmers, as people who interact with the land, don't necessarily have to uh, interact, interfere with it, uh, use it in one way or another, that nature will take care of itself. Do you think that's the case? I think we need to take care of rivers, I would say, for the soil, because soil, mm -hmm. if uh, if I can define in terms of, I can call soil in terms of ambiguation, that's a soul of infinite life. Uh -huh. The What we call about soil biodiversity, it has a multiple lives mm -hmm. in it, starting mm -hmm. from uh, small microbes like from bacteria, fungi, to go yes. to the large number of macrofauna like earthworm and termites. Mm, mm. So unless we don't care about the, the soil, it will not care for us. Because soil is a living living organism, is mm. a living body. Mm. So uh, what we have put into the soil, or let's say if we are relying on a chemical fertilizer or the pesticide, there should be someone in the soil who can push back, who can mobilize the inputs that will reach our crops, will reach our plants so that we can have an optimum number of productions or optimum number of the productivity of crops. So I wouldn't say that soil can, we can leave soil as it is on, but mm -hmm. we need to equally care the soil health as much as we are caring for our farm productivity and the cropland systems. Mm -hmm. Let's then uh, talk about, uh, because that's macro, let's then talk about individual farmers. How would I as a farmer be able to gauge whether my soil is healthy or not? What are the things I can do to get that information? Yeah, I think uh, first of all, uh, there are different components where we consider the healthy soil in terms of the physical, chemical and the biological. Mm. There are some laboratory components, of course, the farmers needs to rely on that extension worker and the researcher, mm. but there are some in-house or the inbuilt uh, in built indicators where the farmers can yes. realize that the soil is healthy, for example, organic matter content. Mm -hmm. And when you see the soil is dark brown to black in color, it means it has an enough amount of organic matter. Mm. The second is the most important thing is uh, having the crop residues in yes. the soils, having the optimum amount of the moisture content. It should not be to look too dry or too wet. Much, yes. Yeah. And the major important in terms of the biological is looking for the biological indicators. Uh, for example, the presence of termites and the earthworms, when you see the scrolling that in, in, in the soil, it means your soil are really healthy and lively, so mm -hmm. that the soil life is also happy mm -hmm. and, and, and they perform better. Mm -hmm. Everything you're saying, doctor, uh, then uh, seems to be at loggerheads with, uh, so to say, modern, uh, modern uh, monolithic, monocultural agriculture. Uh, because you'll go find a uh, large-scale maize, large-scale wheat, large-scale other crop farmers, and they'll say that uh, uh, some will even insist that they want to use hydroponics to grow their stuff so that they can then control the, foil, uh, the soil fully. Uh, they say that uh, termites will eat the roots of their crops and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, they say that some of these things are pests, they'll inter interfere with them. Oh, where is the balance? Yeah, I think uh, for me, uh, I would prefer to do the diversified cropping system and then what, mm. uh, when we go to the farmers, yes. because this is, the monocropping is one of the unsustainable land use practices uh -huh. and where you are again 
playing with your soil health and killing yes. your uh, soil biodiversity. But so it's it, also one of the most prevalent currently in terms of uh, the larger ones. Yeah, exactly. And because that's, again, I, I would say the pushback from the use of the fertilizer and also mm -hmm. there is a pushback from the value chain perspective, mm -hmm. the push from the market values and, and the market yes. assess is the most important. Mm -hmm. And that's what the smallholder farmers mm -hmm. uh, almost uh, concerns about the markets. But again, uh, I would say there are some uh, intercropping systems like, uh, let's say, the horticulture system, mm. which are called the, the small volume, but the large value systems. Mm. And that gi give a, a return in a very small small time, mm. and in a small, a small period of the time. Mm. So it should not be like that. And uh, so the diversified economic system, one or another way, helping you for improving your farm productivity and diversifying your incomes and also sustaining your soil health for Mm. Uh, for I having the think. various types of the biodiversity in the soil. Yes. Yeah. So, so when you look at our farmers, especially at the smaller level, uh, for years, for decades, we've gotten told that the smart agricultural practices, the practices to follow, are those that are pushed by the multinationals, the ones which large-scale farmers have had over time, so that you will then find that even at household level, people are pushing uh, the same international breeds and uh, varieties of maize, uh, same varieties of other staples that have got the international value chain and are grown as just monocultures and mostly are addicted to fertilizer and you cannot replant. This is exactly the opposite of what you're talking about. If we are to think about sustainability, especially in view of the fact that most of, of our farmers are small scale farmers, do you think that there's a better chance for sustainability and better livelihoods under the biodiversity agriculture? Uh, indeed, I think uh, I think so because the uh, small-scale farmers, especially, have tried have now uh, almost uh, at the point where they are understanding about the importance of their soil health, importance of soil biodiversity, mm. and how to sustain their farm in terms of the longer, uh, long-term gains and the long-term productivity. Mm -hmm. uh, you are right because there was a, a long pushback for a very long period of the time mm. in terms of for using the monocropping systems, uh, hybrid seeds, mm. uh, hybrid fertilizers, and so and so. Mm. And most of them, when I uh, go to the field and I hear the stories that they are provided that on the, onto the credit-based systems and where the farmers cannot even replicate the seeds. Mm. So somehow, and also, there's a factor of mutation among, among them. So to cover all these things and to cope up with all these things, I think for the farmers have realized that their traditional practices was much better and uh, like preserving and using the indigenous seeds where farmers are exchanging seed among themselves uh, in, in a local place. And the, the indigenous seeds, in fact, are also more sustainable and more thriving in a changing climate scenarios at any local conditions. Mm. So the smallholder farmers are really, I'm happy to say that they, they, they realize the things and they are now towards mm. into more sustainable practices, into nature positive practices. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at uh, most African value chains today in the agriculture space, uh, everything from market systems to even getting these seeds into the ground, uh, th th there's government in the background, either doing policy, the support aspects like extension and that sort of thing. And so far they have supported the uh, monolithic international uh, value chains where we are getting seeds from a multinational or a local company that's doing this, but then expecting large swaths of farmers in one area to grow one crop because of, uh, so to say, ease of marketing or the creation of staples. How then do you start to come up with policy? that will enable the broad-based application and adoption of the things that we are talking about with a view towards also freeing uh, up uh, consumers from having to just depend on one sort of staple and that sort of thing, that then thus creating pressure on farmers who then put pressure on the soil. Yeah, I think that's a very good question and the answer relies uh, on the recently held uh, African Fertilizer and the Soil Summit in, in Nairobi, in, Nairobi yes. in the month of May, mm. where I was really happy and I was always asking that the policy makers when they talk about the soil health should put soil biodiversity or when they talk about soil, mm. put soil health as in soil biodiversity in the center of 
of all the policies, all the policy makers. So, and uh, I'm happy to share that there was a lot of discussion in around the three days there summit, and the head of states was there for for Kenya as well mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. there was a other head of states, and yes. they really together agreed that we need to be having a plan for the soil health and the soil biodiversity to put into the mainstream so that the small scale farmers can be can be benefited. And uh, instead of relying completely on the on the on the fertilizers or on the production systems, so I think slowly and slowly the things are really changing and is moving and which are really helping farmers. Of course, uh, apart from the policies, I think the researchers and the extension workers really play an important role to bringing that policies uh, from uh, from the government practi practice to the single or the smallholder farmers. Mm -hmm. So I think the things are ri really on, on track now. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let's then talk about the fact that uh, when most people hear uh, soil biodiversity, uh, they go straight to soil testing. And you're telling us that it's not just about soil testing, that there's much more to that ecosystem to understand uh, what exactly the quality of your soil is. How would a farmer then be able to localize that knowledge depending on their various geographies? There are farmers in northeastern who will do crops but on a different kind of soil. There are others in uh, other b many different parts of the world where the soil is different. Yeah, I think uh, the farmers, since they are farming uh, long term, uh, they have a long term experience of doing the different farming practices. Mm. And also they have also changed the, uh, seen the changes in the soils and, and the plants they are doing. Mm. But there are some of the factors that farmers can realize while their soil yes. are changing and either they are improving the productivity or they are not. Mm. Because one and the four most important is, is, the, is the growth and the production mm. systems. With or without fertilizer, sorry. So, so mm. this uh, should be when we talked about the soil biodiversity mm. is 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 completely a uh, soil life mm. which is present in the in in the soil. Yes. So once you are putting a fertilizer, it means you are hampering with them. Mm. You are playing, but of course. The soil biodiversity is important for the inputs you are giving in the soils and to mobilize their things. Suppose you are giving any essential nutrients for any crop around the world which is required nitrogen, phosphorus or potassium. Mm. So then uh, there are the soil biodiversity or the soil microbes that mobilize their uh, that nutrients and help them to uptake to make available to the plants Pal plant root cannot come and take that the nutrients mm. so that's why we are the role of biodiversity or the soil microbes comes in to uh, helping in terms of a higher nutrient uptake in terms of a higher water uh, mm. retention and the uptake by the by the plant roots mm. well, we have entire swaths of this country places like uh, uh, the central rift region, Kitale, that sort of area, where fertilizers have been used for a very long time, and the soil acidity problem became very big, in fact, even became political. Uh, but then the government subsidy program is uh, also in the same sort of trap where we are seeing uh, the handing out of vast quantities of nitrogenous fertilizers. This, to me, would compound the problem of acidity. What should we be looking at so that we can then say that Either one, government is giving specific fertilizers for specific areas that would then assist farmers with the challenges that they have, or then move to something that does not necessitate the delivery of nitrogenous fertilizers so that then we say that uh, uh, farmers are beginning to go back to biodiversity where you then go back to either organic fertilizers or things like minimum tillage, which would then encourage uh, you to reincorporate the material you've taken up the, uh, out of the soil. Where do we go? Yeah, I think that's, that's again a very good question. So this all completely, the system becomes like a different indicator, so the different types that makes a soil healthy. When mm. I talked about organic matter, that's the one thing. The pH was talked about, we know the soils around us is a very acidic. Yes. So the, uh, uh, the solution for that is to bring into the lime or the calcium carbonate to adjust the pH of the different condition. Mm. Because that's the um, one and the most important thing for the healthy soils, pH, organic matter, the climate scenarios, and the land use practices. We should avoid using a uh, high amount of the tillage, overgrazing mm. of the farms, which makes the soils very compact and, yes. and that close the, so, the pore spaces. And so try to do as much as uh, diversified cropping systems in the intercropping in, and avoiding the monocropping system. So all these are the the, I would say the minimum indicators which farmers can immediately can do and can work on on, on themselves and they can and they can see the difference between the healthy and, and the unhealthy soils mm. so yeah
When you, when you look at uh, uh, the things our farmers have gotten used to, and based on the things you've said, uh, it's very difficult. It's been very difficult to get our farmers to start thinking differently. So that when you talk about uh, grazing patterns, when you talk about uh, minimum tillage, um, every planting season you see tractors going into farms and overturning the soil, uh, digging it foot deep, uh, bringing what would have been the top soil three feet under, that sort of thing, really uh, devastating for the soil. We have had advocates of uh, people who simply say you use something like a chisel and plant your crops in that uh, to retain the moisture, but many farmers will not believe it. How do you drive behavior change that then starts to uh, holistically and in broad-based fashion start to adopt the concepts that you're talking about? Where do we even start? Or uh, to think about it in a different way, are there examples of places that you can point to that we can say, hey, it's happening in that place and maybe we can borrow that example? Yeah, I think that's, that's really an important thing. And now when we are talking about sustainable practices and agroecologic practices, mm. So the important component, one of the, apart from economics and the human and the environmental values, the important yes. component comes in that agroecologic practices is the social behavior and how we'll change the behavior in different type of the practices. So currently, I think we, we are promoting that nature positive solutions in also in, and we have two aggregated farms in Kisumu mm. and one a model farm in Viga, mm -hmm. where we are trying to bring such kind of an agroecologic practices and not only the farming practices, but we are also working on, on, on different social behavior and how to change. And so I think belief is, seeing is believing. Mm. So the farmers only believe when they see it. So that's what we are right now trying. And when the farmers, uh, they are doing, and this we are doing along with the participatory approach. It means the farmers are leading, this, uh, leading the different experiment, different mm -hmm. model farms. Mm -hmm. So once they do, they believe on that one, they try to promote. They give go to the neighbor and they promote their things. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the one of, one of the uh, important way where we can uh, slowly start with the small scale farmers yes. and try to replicate in different farms and um, and that also apart from the farming systems as you said we also really it's very important to change the behavior to adopt of the sustainable practices uh, and and different type of agroecological practices which are currently really required. Mm -hmm. we, we, we've seen in uh, even uh, entertainment and television production, things like on Klaxon's farm, the fact that the global market is starting to move towards some of the things that you're talking about where um, they're going back into some sort of mixed cropping. Uh, incidentally, he did wheat and beans in the same field, really interesting concept. And of course, with uh, mixed results, lower productivity, uh, but then allegedly the purchases, uh, the uh, output was sold to large uh, UK retailers and, and the prices were uh, more than uh, three times the usual average. So something for farmers to think about. But how then do we start to enable the demands of the market, uh, the push for sustainability, uh, the push for uh, people who are interested in green living, uh, minimum impact on the environment, that sort of thing, start to percolate to the farmer so that uh, in places like Kenya, we can then say that people are actually starting to farm in a certain way because that's what the market wants. Uh, it seems today like, uh, to me like uh, the discerning market that can dictate uh, what sort of uh, crops they want to come to market growing in a certain way is still very small. That that market is nascent. How do we grow it? Yeah, I think the market is always a, always a big pressure for the, for the farmers and especially for the small scale farmers when, mm. we, when we talked about. But, but the good thing and the important thing is that we are bringing the point of the sustainability here. But apart from sustainability, we need to take care about the growing food demand and the productions and so to meet the food demand of the things like that. So while we are, I guess, while we are taking care about the sustainability and the, and the farming practices, I think it's also important to consider about the production system where we are growing and how mm. much we are growing. And this brings about, uh, along with the sustainability, a very new uh, important factor of the nutrition. Mm -hmm. When we talked about fertilizers, we are... Uh, 
we are almost forgetting about the nutrition conditions. Yes. And when I was watching your bulletin, when we talked about a lot of uh, nutrition in the school children and things like that, mm. and the 18 percent were really uh, the word of the nutrition. I think that's a very important thing. We have the sustainability, and and the agroecologies and the and the soil biodiversity plays a role in bringing the in in meeting the growing food demand as well as bringing the nutrition component into it, mm -hmm. which really market doesn't give you currently. Uh, I would say because they have a lot of pressure on the on the another things what you said about production and the economics and 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 the beneficial in terms of the other things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been an interesting discussion so far, and of course we want to get into the indicators uh, above the soil that would tell farmers how their soil is is working and how it's looking. But before we do that, uh, Dr. Manoj, we want to proceed to a short commercial break. On the other side of the break, the discussion, of course, will continue here on the Farm Kenya on KTN. Uh, KTN uh, News. We, of course, uh, still have about uh, 20 minutes of this show to go to Don't Go In Well. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. I make my Tuesday count. By reading the financial standard, it helps me make much better and smarter financial decisions. Setting the standard every day of the week. The Standard. Kenya's bold newspaper. You saved my life. I'll never ever forget it. Get ready for a roller coaster ride of love, betrayal. Oh, you are such a liar! You're the liar here! And intrigue. This this Welcome to the world of soap operas, where passion runs deep. I will get my revenge. I will get back at all of you. And secrets abound. If I did something wrong, I only did it because I wanted to protect our family. From scandalous affairs to bitter rivalries. Why do you always only see my faults? I'm sorry if I was not as smart as you. KTN Home Soap Operas is your guilty pleasure destination for all things drama. Brace yourself for shocking revelations. Ah, ah, You're heartless! I'll see you You're all monster, burning Lucas. in hell. And unforgettable moments that will keep you on the edge of your seat. It was love that caused my downfall. Don't miss a single episode of your favorite soap where every twist and turn is more captivating than the last. Show me no, where she is right now! Please, calm down! <laughs> where is your mistress? Come here. <laughs> Please. Get Mom. your hands <laughs> off me! <laughs> KTN. Welcome home.
you will not believe who we have in stuff for you this season. I usually buy during a sale, but I'm also a very hard negotiator. The homes are nothing short of magnificent, exquisite, and unique. I think it just brings out that girlish era that I am in. This season, the bar is raised. Once I started floral, it just seemed to um, be themed all over. Take a vicarious journey with me and let's discover, explore, and engage. You are doing the mapping because you want to start growing avocados. You want to, you are drawing a map because you want to know how erodible are your soils. Because these characteristics will tell you how susceptible to erosion the, the, the soils are. So you use that information to draw what we call suitability maps. So you know a crop like uh, tomato or maize or avocado, they have requirements. Now, are these soils, are these units meeting those requirements? If this unit is meeting those requirements, you say that unit is highly suitable for that specific use you want to use it for. If it is meeting some of the requirements, you say it is moderately suitable. If it is, and if, if it is not meeting all the, any requirements by that crop, for example, avocados do not like saline soils, for example. So if your soils were saline, and saline means, if the soils were saline, uh, saline means the electrical conductivity was very high. Sodic soils means the sodium uh, concentration is very high. Sodium is an element in the soil that is very undesirable. Sodium. So if your soils are sodic, you have a big problem. You have to know what do you do with this sodium. But all is not lost because there are mechanisms of amending the soil. For the farmers, it means that now with the scientists that do the soil testing, we can do many more samples. You'll be able to actually meet the needs of a wider clientele in Kenya. And therefore, many of the farmers will be able to access the soil testing services that we offer. Being a potato farmer, you can't do without soil testing because the potato business starts right from the soil. So if you don't know your soil, your soil you don't know any, you won't get anything from the, your, your farm. You just be frustrated. But after doing the soil testing, you know the right fertilizers to use, okay, and the right amount, maybe the, you know the nutrients which are in your, in your soil.
Well, thank you indeed for staying with us here on Farm Kenya. My name again is Peter Wakaba. This penultimate part of the show, as we start to go towards the end, we want to talk about farmers and their appreciation for exactly what we're talking about. Of course, Dr. Manoj, the expert, still here with us in studio. Well, Dr. Manoj, when you think about the farmers that we deal with uh, here in Kenya and beyond, do you think they have understood what... Uh, um, soil biodiversity is, do you think there is good understanding of the concept? Yes, I think so. At, mm. at, at some point there is a good understanding for the farmers of the soil biodiversity, what it is, mm -hmm. at least in, in terms of their soil health. And the farmers have realized to ma how to improve the soil health practices and how to increase the fertility status of the soil so mm. that it looks healthy, it yes. looks nice in, in terms of visuals, mm -hmm. uh, apart from giving a higher amount of the of productivity and the growth conditions uh, to, to the various crop. But still there are some, some things needs to be done where farmers uh, need to be advised in terms of what are the soil biodiversity that includes soil microbes from the small microfauna to, to the large microfauna uh, to uh, like earthworms and the termites and how to improve them and how to how that uh, these all these macro and the mesoforma are helping in in their improving the soil soil mm -hmm. fertility mm -hmm. and the soil health status. Mm -hmm. In some places where land has been under intensive farming, uh, we start to see loss of uh, flora and fauna. Uh, whereby, if, for example, you've been planting maize for ten years in a row, you've uh, pumped fertilizer into the land, you've pumped chemicals, uh, things to do chase away pests and insects, that sort of thing. You start to lose things like bees. Uh, you start to notice that uh, certain things which used to be common, like certain types of birds and that sort of thing, which would eat these insects are no longer there. Uh, with people having listened to what we are saying here today, and then the conversation of restoration of soil biodiversity. So where do we start? How can we then say that we can start the journey of walking the biodiversity journey from here and then move on? What's the first step? Yeah, I think uh, first of all, you you gave the very good uh, reasons for why the biodiversity is mm. is hampering and why it's it's declining in our soils. Mm. So the answer. So is it possible for you to go over those uh, so that we delve into them and then get into the answer? Indeed, exactly. Mm. Mm. So is the first and the most important thing is the unsustainable land use practices. When you are saying is uh, over the years there was a monocropping, excessive mm. use of the fertilizers, some overgrazing and the use of heavy farm machineries, equipments mm. for excessive tillage and so on. So these are all are the factors where that are hampering the soil biodiversity. But certainly it's important, uh, it's, it's possible and important to, to reverse all these things. Mm -hmm. Farmers can help improving the soil biodiversity and the soil health by improving their uh, soil and the uh, land use management practices. The important is, in, in fact, is to reduce the amount of tillage, reduce the use of heavy farm machineries, equipments that, that disturb the soil structure and the textures. It's very important to maintain the soil, soil structure, first of all, and to having the uh, optimum amount of the soil biodiversity. Also, the overgrazing should be, should be reduced. Uh, the fertilizer and the chemical uh, pesticides which has been used for a number of years that can also be reduced. So these are the certain minimum kind of uh, practices where farmers should adopt to improve the soil health and the soil, soil biodiversity. Mm. And of course there are the number of other factors where uh, you bring about in the optimum moisture condition in the soil, not too much drought and the flooding conditions mm -hmm. to bring about the crop mulching, to bring about different crop residues to mix with the soils. Compost is one of the important factors that helps in reviving and restoring the soil health as well as reviving the soil biodiversity. Mm. So that's the starting point, but it, it should go on a longer period of the term because restoring and reviving soil biodiversity mm. is that's something we cannot do in a month or in a two month it mm. requires it's an over a, uh, it's a process that requires over a period of of the land use management practices mm -hmm. the improved land use management practices i would say mm -hmm. often uh, you find that uh, climate change uh, will uh, go uh, hand in hand very closely with the biodiversity such that if you have large climate events uh, either droughts or floods uh, they then wreak havoc with that balance uh, if you then uh, also have instances uh, where 
uh, the biodiversity is out of kilter, uh, then things that you learn should be able to handle, like holding back water, not uh, letting it just run off, and that sort of thing, are also compromised. So how do we then create a balance that enables us, whether these storms, when they come, uh, be able to say that uh, our, bi our biodiversity is our biggest uh, defense against uh, the vagaries of climate change, and then this also now helps us be able to deal uh, with the effects of uh, climate change that we're facing. Yeah, indeed. Uh, so there are two certain scenarios when we talked about climate change. Let's uh, start with the drought, when there is a, a long drought period mm -hmm. and the temperature raises up. So the bio soil biodiversity, which functional biodiversity, I call it, in, in dealing in the field are mesophiles. It means they thrive and they work better for the crops and for the farms. When the temperature is between 20 to 45, they are called mesophiles. And they are the most helpful in uh, nutrient cycling system, nutrient cycling and improving the growth and the production system. Of course, when the, there are certain long drought periods, you are hampering that one. The similar condition relies on the another side when there are long rainy or the flooding seasons mm -hmm. that wash the top layer of the soils, where the most of the soil biodiversity thrives. So, uh, uh, and that uh, the soil biodiversity thrives because of the exudates that plant root has to secrete because they also need something to eat and mm. also the organic matter which is between 0 to 15 centimeter of the top layer of the soils. Mm -hmm. So again, it, it comes to the answer and the question of the improved land use management practices where we use, uh, in terms of drought, where we use a lot of more number of the crop residues, we use uh, a mulching techniques, we'll find the mulching techniques so that it can retain an optimum amount of moisture in the in the soils that can help uh, the soil biodiversity to to retain in the soil at mm -hmm. that period and also to functional uh, in in that drought period also there are certain uh, my soil microbes which are called drought tolerant microbes that helps to sustain growth and the production systems during the drought period but still i would say the mulching and uh, retention of the waters uh, the moisture conditions is very important. On the another hand, when we talked about the flooding, again, there should be an optimum uh, land use and the management practices like uh, use of crop residues, mm. use of mulches, and uh, use of proper uh, burn techniques mm. that helps in flooding or erosion of the top layer of the soils, which are most important for the soil fertility, for the soil health, and also the soil biodiversity. So there are a number of techniques that can be comes in and hand and can be mixed together mm -hmm. to become the conditions ideal in, the, in improving our soil health. Mm -hmm. we, we want to delve deeper uh, into that, especially in view of the different types of uh, modern farm techniques. But we first want to go to uh, our farmer of the day segment, which uh, will speak more into what uh, we are talking about, uh, Dr. Manoj. So let's take a look at that uh, uh, episode uh, today of our farmer of the week for now. Conservation agriculture is intentional farming. You intend of where you want this crop to grow, you put in the food and you leave the rest of the microbial life to rest. That is one of the entry points of not disturbing the soil. The other entry point is having the soil covered. Because just like me, on this sun, if I don't have some clothing, I'll, I'll be uh, dehydrated, all my nutrients will get out, I'll be dusty. So the same, same thing is happening to the soil, and the soil is alive and it has a lot of microorganisms. So it's quite uh, a thing that uh, with this climate change, with this, so, uh, we hear a lot in the media, oh, everything is being carried by this runoff, but the problem is we cut our trees we didn't conserve. We, when I was growing up, I remember the stories I get is when the coffee guys came to see the coffee, they used to use a stick to see how much the mulch is. So the soils were covered by either dry matter or living mulch. As you can see on this whole area, getting enough biomass to do the mulching in these arid, semi-arid areas where the macroorganisms like the termites are too many. They really digest because the soils are not rich in fertile uh, fertility or in organic matter. So it's quite some trouble. So uh, while it's an, uh, a challenge to have a lot of the mulch, it's advisable in conservation agriculture. Just leave the, the live mulch. It helps a lot to, make, to control the micro microclimate. The difference between the soil where there isn't enough or no mulch, mm 
the temperatures are too high. But immediately there is a mulch or some microclimate, the temperatures reduce. So you control the loss of nutrients and moisture in the soil. Well, of that uh, very interesting uh, story uh, there, Dr. Manoj, about conservation agriculture. Uh, let, let's start again at the macro level. In, in the past uh, decades, we saw uh, government uh, foreign farmers, the colonialists, others, come in and put extensive uh, man-made forests uh, where they plant one kind of tree uh, of uh, thousands and thousands of acres in some places. Uh, and this is actually what we're talking about, monocropping. And people don't often realize uh, that this then denies uh, things in nature the opportunity to grow and take up those sorts of species. What should we be doing in this case? Yeah, I think in, in this case, again, when uh, you're saying that people are coming and they're putting the monoculture, mm. uh, the forest forms, is, is again the market driven and the economics driven of, of that particular uh, agenda. But uh, again, I, I'll come to the, the specific point of the biodiversity and mm -hmm. to retaining, to helping the small scale farmers and to uh, to retaining the quality of our soils and the crop health for long-term sustainability. So uh, I would uh, I would differ with saying in the in the mono cropping, but should be it should be a diversified cropping systems, and and that that starts from the agroforestry system, the forestry systems, the crops, uh, and the different horticulture systems. So I would recommend to the farmers to to prefer that one instead of. Uh, mm. Uh, instead of having the market pressure of the market. At, at policy level, are there crops that we can start to uh, talk about, to point to, that uh, people like governments, uh, others, we've seen uh, a lot of agriculture getting devolved to the grassroots. Uh, are, are there things we can point to that we then see that these are very friendly towards a, the diversified, mixed kind of cropping systems? Uh, that enable us to do that conservation agriculture, that enable us to do minimum tillage, that enable us have multiple crops in one setting so that we then start to regenerate our soil in the ways that we're saying. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I think the, the good thing about our policy system is mm -hmm. that and they rely mostly on, on the staple crops, yes. which the farmers are really in, in, the, in terms of their own consumption or in terms of the market. And now the governments are really promoting, as I said, in this African Soil uh, Fertilizer Summit. Mm. Uh, so and, and and the farmers have also started caring about of diversifying the production systems. Suppose uh, one time you are uh, uh, using the maize and you are mixing it, it with the legumes. So the crop in hand, they are mutually benefiting each other. The legume yes. is providing a nitrogen, nitrogen fixer to yes. the to the maize, and so you need not to add uh, external inputs uh, inputs in the farm because they are mutually benefiting each other. Similarly, if you mixed for uh, the cropping system diversifying the farm let's say you were talking about agroforestry system or the different or let's say again take the example of cassava or maize and you are diversifying you are putting in in some horticulture system so on and hand uh, one way you have a staple crop another mm. way you have an horticulture crop which mm. is really uh, economic crop i would say so it be, uh, gives farmers a higher return in a shorter period of our time so th i think that's that's the point uh, uh, where we need to make the balance of of, of our farming systems mm -hmm. uh, w one of the things that would enable us be able to engage in this more holistically more sustainably is the use of uh, technology modern technology which would then enable you be able to farm but at, uh, in a way that is not as invasive and that sort of thing. Now, one of the major challenges to that uh, approach is at the average age of an African farmer, uh, north of 50 in most cases, uh, very hard to change their behavior, very hard to drive the uptake of technology and that sort of thing. Do you think as we get younger and younger farmers into the mix, we've seen the uh, conversation around the Gen Z and the creation of job opportunities as we get these people into these sorts of value chains. Do you think the uh, results will be positive in terms of what we are talking about? Indeed, yes, I would say, because now uh, when we talked about uh, about the social behavior and social change, is the young population who are really concerning about, apart from the job creation, which is again a very important factor in the sustainable farming practices and things mm -hmm. like that, and is also improving the livelihood of uh, 
of the people because uh, when you say uh, the food is organically grown and one is grown with the fertilizer of course the people prefer about organic and this comes from the factor of the nutrition yes. and of the human health mm -hmm. where the young population and the young people yes. immediately recognize and they realize okay for me I have to work, but first of all, my health is important. Mm. So that's where uh, the good thing is that 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 it's easy to drive in that factors yes. and in, in the notion of considering the market opportunities, the job opportunities, as well as bringing the concept of the nutrition and the healthy diets. Uh, and and we we are happy. Like at uh, some point, the government has also started these things in at the school levels where they are promoting the nutritionists. And some leafy vegetables, kind of a healthy, healthy food in, in in the school system, and there are a lot of school feeding programs that has been started. So I think the young population are really interested in that, and there are growing demand on moving our agriculture system towards towards this side. Mm -hmm. Are there any countries and any jurisdictions where you can say that we've started to see this becoming broad-based, that they've started to walk the talk in terms of? Uh, uh, really uh, doing the regenerative action on soil or even conserving it or have been doing it all along? Any place that we can start to borrow lessons from? Yes, I would say there are a, a lot of number of people like those who are really working on the ground, especially like for us, uh, we as a researcher, as an international organization, bringing the expertise from the different, mm. different globe and how the farming practices differ from Africa to Asia and to Latin America. But there are so many other partners, uh, including uh, uh, so many NGOs who are here really working on ground, especially in Kisumu and in Vihiga, where we are currently working, mm. in Kenya only, mm -hmm. where the people bring expertise from the different uh, parts of the globe, even in, in different parts of the countries, and they are trying to help the farmers, they are trying to share the knowledge. That's the good thing about agroecologies and the sustainable farming practices and nature positive. Mm -hmm. uh, when there is a boom, People come together, they share the practices and they share the benefits, they share the knowledge. So I would say there's a lot of opportunities and a lot of organizations, they are already having a deep dive into it. Mm -hmm. And in, indeed, we are also working uh, with the national partners. We are like a Carlo Kibos in, in Kisumu and the other parts. So they are also really interested in, in that part and they are also sharing their expertise and we are working together hand in hand mm -hmm. and sharing the experience. Mm -hmm. In conclusion, as we start to wind up, uh, let's talk about the value chain, the entire thing from uh, the crop to market in terms of uh, uh, conservation of our biodiversity. This pre presents uh, lots of opportunity for uh, wealth and job creation for the youth and many other people along that value chain. Where do you think the opportunity is being that people can start to have their own niches and uh, be able to create livings either uh, creating advisory for farmers or helping them walk this journey of restoration of their soil. Yeah, I think the opportunity relies from, from the starting point until the end point. When you start from the production system, you go until the uh, until the value chain system or the, or, or the market mm. values. So uh, when I was talking about organic farming practices or organic yes. system in an aggregated forms, mm. let's say somebody has a compost plant. Yes. And they have uh, some livestock. So they try to, they can use the, uh, the livestock for making the compost. Mm. And that has a real uh, value. It, it's a gem that can be used in improving the soil fertility. Mm -hmm. That can be sold in a market very easily. And then you go to the crops. You are mm -hmm. putting that compost in the farms. You look for the crops. You try to sell your crops, improving the productivity and also whatever. Uh, in 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 the different in different perspective, and then after the crop, you have a different post harvest um, uh, value chains that uh, your crop is bringing in different types of the crop. So at every step, there are the opportunities that relies uh, in all these value chains, starting from the consumer level to the to the pr producer level to the consumer level, and until you go to the uh, to the last point. Mm -hmm. So I think the young generation are really, uh, really need to uh, need to tap these uh, opportunities and to, to work on, on this. There is a huge market potential. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, so finally, uh, in case you feel uh, there's something that you feel we've not touched on, this is then the opportunity for that as we close. Uh, anything important that uh, you feel uh, we need to highlight that we may not have been able to talk about so far? 
Yeah, I think uh, the first and the foremost thing is uh, concerning about the production system and when we are talking about smallholder farming systems, mm. we all like uh, but, uh, policy makers, extension workers, researchers, we all should come together to help them mm. because they are the backbone of the country. They mm. are the backbone of any um, anything, I would say, in the globe. Huh? Mm. Uh, if, if there is no food, there is no life. Yes. So they are the producers. Mm. And... Um, so we need to be, make the policies that as researchers brings the knowledge, the extension worker brings the technologies, that mm, a kind of a mixed system that uh, helps these farmers and so that they are really happy and in terms of uh, their production system, in terms mm. of the economics and in terms of the livelihood. So that's the, uh, that's the knowledge and the sharing we mm. together we need to bring to you. Mm -hmm. So essentially what you're saying is that the backbone of the global food economy is a small scale farmer, not necessarily the large uh, conglomerates, the large farmers that we have been focusing on in a very, very big way. Um, in closing then, I think uh, it's uh, safe then to say that uh, Dr. Ruby have been able to impart quite a bit of knowledge uh, today for our young farmer. So thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us here today. Uh, we of course hope to have you later on so that we can delve into other aspects of uh, uh, the soil diversity that we might not have touched on. But for now, thank you very much. And uh, for viewers, of course, to remind you that uh, the Farm Kenya show continues here tomorrow, of course, uh, discussing other topics along the agriculture value chain. But for now, our time is up. Of course, the show continues here on KTN, so do stay with us. My name is Peter Akaba. It has been a blast, and see you again next time. Thank you very Kenya, I'm Kenya.